morning, church. Welcome to Bethel. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to read the scripture, and then Norm is going to open our service in prayer. Our choir and all our worshipers have prepared a song. You're welcome to join us. The words are going to be up on the screen. If you'd like to sit back, if you can sit back and relax, you're welcome to do that as well. My scripture is from 1 Peter 3. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And now Norm will pray. Thank you, Jesus, for uniting each one of us today. Thank you for bringing this many beautiful families here. Thank you that it's your breath in our lungs. Thank you, God, that he overcame death. Thank you for your faith. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory and honor this morning, Lord. Because you're such a good father. As we celebrate this very important day today, we remember the great work that Jesus did for us. We are here today because of that. And I would like now to invite the communion servers, and they will take communion as we remember what Jesus did for us. Thank you, Jesus. The choir will still just stay where you are, choir, please. Just stay where you are. No rush. Just stay where you are. It's a very special day today, as I said. That we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when we talk about Easter, if we do it in a, a life application of what Easter is, it's all about two things. God so loved the world. It's all about love. And not just love, he loved the world and he had a plan for us. So God loved you and offered a wonderful plan for your life. That's why we are here today. John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only and only one son, what so, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So he loved us. Why? Because he had a wonderful plan for us so that when, you, when you, you turn to him, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life. Now because of that love, because of that plan, he planned that because we were all sinners. And sin had separated us from God. But he said, I want to do something. I just love them. And I want to make a plan. And Jesus died. Why? Because he wanted to redeem you and me. What a wonderful plan. Friends, we are here because of that plan. So as we remember that today, I want you to think of that wonderful plan. And maybe you're here, you haven't given Jesus, you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus and made him your personal savior. This will be such a wonderful time for you to do that. Because he loved you. And not only loving you, but he had a plan for you. A plan for you. Now as the choir sings, we'll be taking those, uh, I mean distributing the emblems. If you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, I would kindly advise you to refrain from taking that. But if you have just decided that this is my personal Savior, Jesus, and you can take that, 
as a remembrance of what he did for you and me. Such a wonderful plan. Why? Just because of love. He loved us. So this time I'll just invite the servers to display the emblems. And then I'll keep singing that song. I'll cherish the old rugged cross. have your elements will do please stand now with your holding your elements together just stand with me now if you have your elements already
Again, I'll cling, I'll cling. I will cling to the ragged crown and exchange it someday for a crown. Friends, as you're holding that. That means a lot in the life of a Christian. Something which Jesus did, and he said you should do this in remembrance of me. Why? Because this is something we need to remember. The death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth as a reflection of what Jesus said. He's saying that, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you, which is for me, which is for our children, which is for our grandchildren, which is for the current generation and for ge the generation to come. Do this as remembrance of me. Let's all take the bread. Apostle Paul keeps saying, in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread, and also drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Until he comes. Let's all take the cup. And while the piano is playing in the background, I want you to take a moment. Just be still where you are. I want you to take a moment, if you can just close your eyes and think about this. Thank you, Jesus. Just think about this, that he died for us because he loved us and he had a plan for us. He loved us and he had a plan for us. Thank you, Jesus. 
You're free to tell him the words from your mouth. But thank you, Jesus. Oh, Shanti. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Give you glory and honor. Such a good father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In your own words, just say something to him. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. On. I hate to break this with announcements, but here they are. So, he is risen. What a wonderful and exciting morning to think that our Jesus has come alive from the dead and what God has done for us. Amen. Uh, quickly, I'm just going to go through these. We have our winning at conflict seminar for couples engaged dating married old married new married next saturday and it will be right after church we will provide some uh some kind of lunch <laughs> some kind of lunch we'll have lunch for you and then we will get right into the seminar um so that is next saturday please either or sunday thank you thank you pastor ben see he's on it and uh, it's right after church. If you have not signed up yet, please register. Either call the office or online. You have a choice, but we would like to have some idea of numbers for that. Then that same evening, we have the ecumenical service here in Bethel. We are hosting, and uh, we just ask that you all come. You come and support um, our churches and that we can all be together as one. Plan to Protect training is April 14th. It'll be quick and easy. Um, and we have a farewell potluck for Pastor Boniface and Happy on Sunday, April 21st, I believe. It says April. It's the 21st, I believe. So we would like you to attend that also. Um, we just have a few people that are still struggling in health in their body, and by his stripes, we are healed. Um, I'm thinking of Lester Kent and, and Helen and, and um, Nettie, Oscar. We have some that are struggling, and we just ask that you just continue keeping them in prayer. And as I said, as this whole Easter season is coming about, we are remembering why we have that healing and that we can have that healing in our bodies. So please continue to pray for them. Um, I will ask the ushers to come at this time for our tithes and our offerings. Thank you to the board and Carol for that wonderful breakfast this morning.
They were here yesterday, and they were here. Actually, I was lying in bed this morning, and I said to Tim, I said, he says, you'd like to sleep a little longer, wouldn't you? And I said, yep. And he says, and then I said, but you know what? Carol and Marvin are driving to the church already. I said, I kind of felt bad. But anyway, they, they uh, thank you to our board and to Carol for all the work that you put into that breakfast. I can't, I can't express how much we value our volunteers. Um, Norm and I had a little discussion about that this morning, and uh, we value each and every one that volunteers in Bethel. So thank you, and God bless you. Lord, we just lift up this offering to you today. We just thank you, Father God, for every gift and every giver. And Father, that this offering today, whether it be our tithe or an offering above, Father, just go to further your kingdom, that it touch our community, Father God, and that people just see that Jesus is alive. Father, I thank you in all that you give us and that we give it back to you gratefully. In your name, amen. It is now my privilege to announce Pastor Corey um, and Corey Randall. He is from our district district office. He is our second in command after Pastor Gary. He is the, the assistant superintendent, I guess is how we would call you, um, for our district, for the Alberta Northwest Territories region. And he is going to give us the word today. And he is also going to um, um, do the affirmation for Pastor Ben. So I just ask that you give Pastor Corey a big hand. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It is a privilege to be back in Barrowhead. It's been a while since I've been here. The last time I was here, we were having a little bit of a town hall and a discussion, and from that discussion emerged the opportunity to have fantastic transitional pastors, Pastor Boniface and Happy, and they've done an amazing work, have they not? And uh, through, this, through this time of, of transition, of course, we've seen so many great things. And just we've seen the family of God come together and walk the church through uh, a process whereby now we get to affirm or quote-unquote install a new pastor, a new lead pastor for your church. The good news for us is that Pastor Boniface is now going to be working at the district office with us. Uh, and that's amazing. We didn't know this was on the horizon, but through the work of God and the calling of the Holy Spirit, we were able to see that take place. So we're just looking forward to it. So we may let them come back here from time to time to visit. Would you like that? Yay! We'll, we'll, we'll try to do that from time to time to see if you can come back. That'll be great. You know, um, so yeah, as part of a pastoral affirmation, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we've had a couple of thousand years of doing this kind of work that we would call the Great Commission work. And the Great Commission is to make disciples who make disciples, reach lost people. That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's what it was all about. It was on the day of Pentecost when there was approximately 3,000 people that were swept into the kingdom of God. They had an experience that changed their life. I want you to understand that what had taken place in those days is all the, the people of um, Jewish descent would gather in Jerusalem for festivities. It was what they called the Feast of Pentecost. And they went and they gathered and they got together. And, and in that very meeting, it is the place where the Spirit of God was poured out in such a way that people encountered God in a way they had never encountered Him before. And it changed their lives. So much so that there was this fledgling little church of about 120 people who met, the Bible says, in a rented room. And they became these people who just started to preach the gospel. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God was poured out so tremendously that lives were changed. And there was a firestorm of churches that started to spring up all over the Roman Empire. And really, it happened in the simplest of ways. These people went to Jerusalem. They were part of the festivities. When they left those festivities, they went back to wherever they lived. They lived on some farm. They lived in some other area, some rural area, some remote area, whatever it was. And guess what happens? You talk to your neighbor at the Tim Hortons or wherever they might be, and you connect with people. And then you say, hey, George, how are you? Oh, great. You know, things are well. 
Oh, where were you on the weekend? Oh, well, I was actually in Jerusalem. We had our festivities. Oh, yeah, you guys go and celebrate that. What was that like? Well, let me tell you what that was like. It was as simple as that. There was no organized Christianity. They just started to tell the story of the gospel of Jesus. They just started to tell their story. Making disciples who make disciples. So following this time, the apostles started traveling through the regions of Europe and Asia, Asia Minor, Africa, and so on and so forth to help set up this firestorm of Christian churches that had now started. They realized there had to be some sort of organization here. There needed to be some help, and so they did that. The Apostle Paul wrote to Titus, and he said this, and Titus in that time was acting in the capacity of what we would call a, a bishop or a superintendent. And Paul told him to make sure you travel through the cities in Crete where there are churches and appoint overseers, or what we would call pastors. That's what Pastor Boniface has done. That's what Pastor Ben is going to do. Now, the New Testament leaves this whole idea of church governance pretty vague. It's not something that's carved in stone. However, there is something that is very, very clear in the Bible. And it's almost universal across the globe as it relates to churches. And it dates back to Paul's letter to Titus. When he said, appoint overseers, almost all churches in history have used the pastoral leadership model. There has to be someone to lead. Biblically, from the Old Testament all the way through to the New Testament, we see that God established leadership. Whether it was Moses, whether it was Joshua, whether it was a king, God established someone to lead. Leadership is important. So we know everyone in church should help. You should give. You should volunteer. You should clean, play music, sing in a choir, whatever it is. Everyone should do something. But the most influential component in a healthy, vibrant church is not the only component, but the most influential component of a healthy church is the church's lead pastor vital. The Maxwell axiom is simply this, everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything. If you have a business and you run a firm, you know that what you do is important. It has to be run well. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And that's why Paul said to Titus, make sure that every church has an overseer. So that's why today is such an important day for Barhead such an important day for this community, for this church. Because we want to officially affirm Pastor Ben and Tanny as the lead pastors of Bethel Church. I would like to ask them to come forward if they would. And if you have some family members, they would like to come as well. We would invite those to come forward. If you're able, if not, that's fine. And I'd also invite the board members and Pastor Boniface and Happy to come. You guys can just stand right across here, across the front, if that works. As they come, I just want to give you a couple more thoughts. You see, in our form of organizing churches, the congregation picks their pastor. You've done that. You you've did, did a vote. You, you picked your pastor. So the reason that I'm here today, the reason that I'm here today is because years ago in our churches, the Pentecostal Seminars of Canada, we decided to band together. We decided to connect together. Because we believed in training people. We believed it's important to raise up leaders and pastors. We believed it was important to develop Bible schools so people can go get trained and have doctoral training and theological training and so on. And one of the things we do is also confirm the authority and the giftedness and the call of the pastor to a local church, which is what we're doing here today. So on behalf of 1,100 churches across our great country, and Pastor David Wells, our general superintendent, who you would know. And Pastor Gary Tatinger, our superintendent for the Alberta Northwest Territories District of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. We want to say yes and amen to you, church, for your decision to pick these people to be your pastors in Barhead Church. 
So as leaders in the district, we join with you. We are part of you. We're connected with you. And we want to commission and affirm Pastor Ben and Pastor Tanny. Now, I want you to hear what I'm saying here. We know you elected Pastor Ben. That's not lost on me. But I'm going to tell you, as a pastor and as someone who's married to a very important person in my life, that I can't do what I do without her. And she's as much as a pastor as I'll ever be. Probably more so. She helps to carry the load. And Tanny, you help carry the load. You help shoulder the responsibility. You take calls that Ben can't take. You talk to people and have conversations that Pastor Ben can't have. You do things that are so important. So folks, I want you to do me a favor. Protect your pastors. Don't be picking up the phone every minute of every day and say, I'm just going to call the pastor's wife and talk to her. Give her a break. <laughs> they carry a lot of weight. Protect them. God has called them for such a time as this. Do your level best to support them, to come alongside them. Will you always agree with them? No. But it's okay to not always agree. What's important is that you maintain the unity. And you pray for your pastors. You pray for their families. They sacrifice their lives for you. Many of you have been in this church for years and years and they uprooted themselves time and time again to pastor different places where God has called them. Not because it's easy, only because God's called them to do so. So with that in mind, I would ask you as a congregation, would you stand to your feet for a moment and we're going to, in a posture of prayer, would you just hold out your hand toward them as if you're laying your hands upon their shoulders I would like to get the board members over here to gather around them and the family members to come close to mom and dad and the grandkids. If you all could all kind of coalesce around here in the center a little bit. And I've asked Pastor Boniface, I believe you have a microphone, I've asked Pastor Boniface to pray over Pastor Ben and Tanning this morning because this is a bit of a passing of the baton. Pastor Boniface has done a great job, and, and Pastor Happy has done a great job. But we're moving into a new season now. We want to pass the baton well. We want to do things well. So this morning, Pastor Boniface, I'm going to ask you to pray a commissioning prayer over Ben and Tanny this morning. So if you can stretch your hands toward them as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this mm -hmm. morning. Yes, God. You are the one who calls people from different areas of their lives yeah. and you bring them in your field that they will do what you want them to do yeah. and you called Pastor Ben and Tani for such a time as this yes, God. Thank you. Mm -hmm. they've been doing the work of the kingdom yeah. for years yeah. and we didn't know that for such a time as this they will be here again in Barhead Bethel but you knew that because everything is in your power. And Father, we pray for them as they assume this role today of lead pastor mm -hmm. for this church. Mm -hmm. We know that you are going to be with them, Lord. Because when you call your people, you always give them something for your people. And you have called them, I know you have something very special for this church. And I believe so because you are the one who led mm -hmm. us even through the process. We didn't know that, but you led us through the process because you knew that you wanted him here now for such a time as this. Father, we pray over them in Jesus' name. We pray for wisdom, mm -hmm. knowledge, divine impartation, Lord, for everything they are doing and everything they will be doing for this congregation. We pray for divine favor in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you go before them. Just like you went before Moses when he was leading the Israelites to the promised land. We pray that you go before them. That nothing, nothing will prevail against your church. Father, we thank you. Because you are going to bless Ben and Tani. And we're going to be with them, Lord. And we know that we're going to 
to receive a lot of testimonies from this church for how great you have been and what you have been doing for this church. And that has been our prayers because this is your church. We thank you, Lord, and we give you glory and honor as we commission them, them now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, you please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your new lead pastors. going to dismiss the children this morning. You're free to go. Uh, Pastor Teresa has lots of wonderful things for you to do today, so go ahead. You can be dismissed. Look at that, eh? Can we give the kids a huge round of applause? Isn't that amazing? How wonderful people. You know, a, a church that has a robust children's ministry is a church that will train and keep their kids into the next generation and the next generation. Children are so important. Even though they, you know, they're sometimes a challenge to work with and, and they... they hard to get out of bed in the morning and et cetera, et cetera. But when you as a parent bring your children to church and you get them plugged into a robust kids ministry, it will change the water in the fishbowl. It'll help prolong your church into the future by God's grace. So the Bible says train your children in the way that they should go, right? And that's important. Before I preach this morning, I just want to just pray and ask the Holy Spirit's help in what we do. Father, we just thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And God, this morning I stand there, Lord, not in my own strength or power or ability, but in your authority. I stand here this morning, God, Lord, knowing that you have all things under con your control. And Father, I pray this morning in Jesus' mighty name that you would open our minds to comprehend. You would open our ears to hear, and you will open our hearts to receive what the Spirit of God is speaking to us. God, I come against every stronghold that would set itself up against you. Father, I pray for every soul in this place. I pray for every soul in this community. And I ask God in Jesus' name, the name that is above every name, that you would move in this place today. Move in our hearts and across this community for your glory, for your honor, and for your name's sake, so that you will be made great. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say it. Amen. You can throw up that first slide there. I was, uh, I was in New York City a few years ago and, you know, doing the whole tourist thing. And when I'm there, I went to Central Park. I wasn't staying too far away, so we could walk there. I went to Central Park, and uh, there's something there that, that's called the John Lennon Memorial. You, you may have seen it if you've been there. And there's this huge mosaic built on the ground by his wife, Yoko Ono. She gave New York City millions of dollars so she could install this in Central Park because it's across from the Dakota Hotel where John Lennon was, was, uh, was shot and eventually died. And people go there all the time and they do this. They put out flowers, they sit, they have a moment together and uh, they, they imagine what it would be like if you still had a world with John Lennon in it. And that's what that symbol says, imagine. Imagine. And that's his memorial. Like I said, people from around the globe travel there to visit John Lennon's memorial. And that often happens when someone famous dies. We, we memorialize their grave, right? Uh, anyone, anyone here ever been to Graceland? I'm not an Elvis fan, but there must be some Elvis fans, okay? Like, someone raised their hand. We'll pray for them later, you know? But... <laughs> But, great, but people went there because it, it was, Elvis has been memorialized. People want to go. They want to see. They want to, they want to touch. They want to try to get a sense of the presence that was there. And they memorialize their grave. And, and it's interesting that when a religious leader dies, their grave becomes enshrined. 
like an enshrined grave, very different from just something that's memorialized. Now, there are four major religions in the world today that were started by a person. Four. Not just a system of ideas or thought or philosophy, but there are four systems that were started by someone. The first one is Judaism. Now, you would recognize that because we're connected. We're grafted in. But Judaism was essentially started by Abraham. And today, if you went to visit Hebron in the Holy Land, you would find that there is a memorial, a worship site built over the entombed body of Abraham. And you can visit it to this day. The next one would be Buddhism. The Buddha is buried in India. Over his tomb, there's an enormous place of worship. And people pilgrimage there year after year to visit the embodied, the entombed body of the Buddha. And there are several of these sites, but these are one of the, the main places. And then there's Islam. Islam is founded by this guy some 600 years after Christianity. His name was Muhammad. He was disgruntled with Jews and he was disgruntled with Christians. So he started his own religion. And you can go and you, to a place called Medina and you can visit Muhammad's tomb, and people pilgrimage there on a regular basis. And the fourth one is what we call Christianity. Christianity was founded by the man Jesus, also known as Jesus Christ. Jesus. Now what's interesting about Jesus, and what's interesting about this whole system of ideas and so on, is that there is no tomb for Jesus. There's no place that's been enshrined. There's no place that people can go visit. And no one has any idea where the most famous person in the world is buried. Why is that? Because Jesus is alive. That's why Jesus is alive. Now, there is a garden tomb, and you can visit the garden tomb, and they can show you what a tomb in those days may have looked like. But if you talk to the archaeologists that are at that site, they would tell you that in all likelihood, Jesus was never put here. In all likelihood, this is not the place. No one knows where the place is. The archaeologists don't know. You can ask questions about the most apt scientists and teachers and theologians in the world, and not one of them can tell you where Jesus is buried. His tomb is not enshrined because he is alive. And he's still alive to this day. And he's still working in his church around the world. Jesus is alive. Unlike every other major world religion, there is no proof that our founder, Jesus Christ, is dead. So, that brings us to a question. And the question is this. Who is Jesus? What we know historically is that Jesus lived over 2,000 years ago. We know that he lived in a small town. We know that he had a young mother. Her name was Mary. We know that his father was a carpenter. We know that he had brothers and sisters. And somewhere around the age of 30, this person named Jesus, which, by the way, was a very common name in those days, but he went out and he started his public ministry of teaching and discipling and praying over people and et cetera, et cetera, and healing people. He started to do something publicly. Jesus was never a world traveler. He didn't travel more than 90 miles from his home. He lived in a very simple way, but whatever he did, he did with God in mind, God, his Father, in mind. Yet, he is the most influential person that's ever lived in all of history. And this is not something that I'm espousing or making up. This is recorded fact. The reality is when it comes to Jesus, there have been more songs written about him. There's been more paintings painted of him. There's been more books written about him than anyone else in all of human history combined. Jesus is alive. It's a Canada fact that Jesus lived on this earth. It's a fact. 
There's no one else on public record who has ever transformed the world more than Jesus. Nobody. There is not a single person that has brought the transforming power of the life and liberty of God into the world except for Jesus. Nobody. You can go back historically and you can read the records for yourself. You can look at Josephus, Jewish historians, who talked about Jesus, who who was from Nazareth, and the work that he did, and the healing that he did. Jesus. Two of our largest holidays are centered around Jesus. What do we do at Christmas time? We celebrate what? Jesus' birth. And guess what we do at Easter? We celebrate his resurrection because he's alive. We are the church of Jesus Christ only because of Jesus. We are the church of Jesus Christ because he did die on a cross, because he did raise again on the third day, and he did ascend to heaven and sit at the right hand of his Father, and he will come back for his church, and the day is coming when the eastern sky will split and Jesus will return for his church, and the church of Jesus Christ must be ready. You ever think that our calendar is based on Jesus? You ever think about that? Stuff that just kind of goes over our head. B.C., before Christ. A.D., after death. All based on Jesus. It's interesting that history, history itself tells us a lot about who Jesus was. It really does. But what did Jesus say about himself? The Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus made this audacious statement when he said, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. You see, what Jesus was telling people in his day then is that I was here before time existed. That I was here long before I was born into this world by the Virgin Mary. I was here long before. I was here before time. I've come down from heaven. In Micah 5.2, it tells us, it's, amazing, it's an amazing prophecy in the Old Testament about Jesus. And it says this, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the, the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are of old, from ancient times. I want you to understand something here. When this statement is made, origins of old and from ancient times, it translates in the actual Hebrew to mean this. He is from the days of eternity. That Jesus That he was God before time began. He was the one that hovered over the firmament. It is the one that when you read in the book of Genesis about the, the creation of the world, Jesus is speaking about himself. That's who he is. That he existed in eternity past and he will exist into the future. He is without beginning and without end. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is ruler of the universe. He flung the stars into place, and his name is Jesus. People that heard Jesus' claims in those days were astonished. But not only were they astonished, they were offended. They started to murmur and complain and make comments. They're like, wait a second, wait a second. He's saying he came down from heaven. He's saying that he came from God. How can this be possible? Didn't we see this kid in the marketplace? Isn't his father just just this carpenter that we know? His mother is Mary. We've seen him around. How can he say that he's come from God? And people started to insult him and, and not believe his claims. Well, here's what they didn't know. What they didn't know was that Jesus Christ came to earth on a rescue mission. He came here to be a sacrificial lamb. He came here because he knew that the world needed saving. 
that the world needed rescuing, and the only way that God could use the, 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 to bring people to Jesus was they would send a perfect sacrifice, and that perfect sacrifice not in the form of a lamb, but in the form of a human being named Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that you and me could have life, and have life to the full, the Bible tells us. You see, they didn't understand that Jesus was not just, was just a man. They didn't get that. They only saw him from human eyes. They didn't see with eyes of the Spirit. But Jesus was not just a man. You see, that's the first and greatest lie in history that you can be godlike. Jesus was not just a man. He was the God-man. He was God's creation. He was not, sorry, he was not God's creation. He was what God, he was God's plan for humanity. And they just saw a man. They didn't see the God man. The enemy would tell you, you can be God of your own soul. See, many of you in this room today, you're here visiting, you're thinking, how did I wind up in this place today? You're here by divine appointment. That's why you're here today. And the first and greatest lie in history, the enemy would tell you is that you can be master of your own ship. You can be master of your own destiny. That's what he said in Genesis chapter 3 to a person that we know as Eve in the beginning of time in the place called the Garden of Eden when he went to Eve and he said, you know, hey, if you eat from this, uh, this tree of knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God. And many of us have acted God-like in the way we live. But the fact is, we'll never be like God. We'll never become God in any way. But God, out of love for His creation, came down from heaven to be like one of us. What else did Jesus say about Himself? Jesus said that He is more than just a good man. In Mark chapter 10, there's an amazing story of a young man who comes up to Jesus. And this young man comes up to him and he falls down on his knees, the Bible says, in verse 17 and 18 of, John, of Mark chapter 10. And as the man runs up, he falls on his knees and he says, Good teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response in verse 18 is this, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God. Nobody except God, is good. As human beings, we are not good. As human beings, we are fallen. As human beings, we have sin in our lives. We've got sin in our past. And if you're like me, you've probably got sin in your future. We're all sinful by nature. We're sinful by birth. But this young man made the same tragic mistake that many people make today. They would say that Jesus is just a good man. He's a good person. The Muslims would say that he was a good prophet. But they would deny the fact that Jesus is God. You see, many of us today, we admire the Jesus we see in pictures. We admire the Jesus who's a suffering servant. We admire the Jesus who in many cases, is just a humble, generous, contrite person. We admire that Jesus. We admire someone that, that you know, would be kind to strangers and, and would heal the hurting. We admire that Jesus. But I want to tell you, while Jesus is all of those things, my friends, you need to know that He is so much more. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is more than just a good man. You see, many of us want to reduce Jesus to merely being on our level, to being a good person, to being a good man. But he's not just a good man. He is the God man, flesh incarnate. He is the God man. Many people's Christianity is based on a good Jesus, not the God Jesus. What's your Christianity based on today? This young man says, good teacher, or in other words, good man. And Jesus stops him and says, don't call me good. In other words, do you not understand yet who you're speaking to? Don't call me good. 
I am God. I have proof that I'm God. Look at what I've been doing. I am God. So when it comes to following Jesus, you see, you have to follow Jesus on God's terms, not on your terms. You have to follow him for who he says he is, not who you want him to be. And many people want to follow Jesus for the person they want him to be. And we follow this convoluted Christianity and we espouse things that's not even scripturally sound or not even based on Jesus. Jesus is a miracle worker. John chapter 10, verses 39. Verses 30 to 39. And let me read this for you. We have people and they're grumbling against Jesus. And Jesus says, well, you don't believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do the works... If I do these miracles, he's saying, even though you do not believe me, you don't believe that I've come down from heaven, you don't believe that I am the God-man, you don't believe who I am, but if you don't believe me, Jesus is saying, believe the works so that you will know and you will understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And that's what Jesus was saying to these Pharisees and teachers of the law. Jesus was saying, wait a second, you don't believe what I'm saying. You think I'm a liar. You think what I'm saying is some sort of mythical thing that's taking place. What I'm telling you is that I have come down from heaven. I am the God-man. I am a miracle worker. Just look at what I've been doing. Look at the saving. Look at the healing. Look at the transforming. Look at the blind eyes opening. Look at the dead rising. Look at the works of God because only God can do that in a person. So Jesus said, fine, don't believe me, but look at the works. Look at what I'm doing. And instead, they accused him of what they call blasphemy. Now, blasphemy was simply, you declare yourself to be God. And they said, well, no one can do that. But they didn't understand what Jesus had done. How God had planned this from the very beginning of time. You see, my friends, Jesus is not a speaker of lies. No, he is a teller of truth. He is Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says, you don't believe me, but look at the proof. Look what I've been doing. Jesus also says he's sinless. Now there's a claim for you. Okay, maybe I can come alongside and believe that there's things that happen that I can't explain as it relates to, to prayer and, and people getting healed or, or transformation taking place in someone's life. Maybe I can get that far, you're thinking. But now Jesus is making this statement. He says, I'm also sinless. I want you to understand that sin includes things like your thoughts, your deeds, your motives. This claim by Jesus that I am sinless, is a claim that is unchallenged to this day. Let me ask you, do you know one person that has never, ever done anything wrong? Not even one? You don't know a single person who's never said something wrong, thought something wrong, did something wrong? You don't know a single one out of all of this congregation of people? You don't know even one? I know one, and his name is Jesus. You see, we are all with sin. We've all fallen short, the Bible says. We've all missed the mark. Because sin does encompass our deeds, our thoughts, and our motives. And Jesus makes this claim. And when he makes this claim, it's it's a statement that jars those of authority. It's a statement that they couldn't comprehend. As in John 8, he says, does anyone have any proof, any proof whatsoever of any sin that I have committed? If so, speak up, he's saying. Is there anyone that has any proof that I'm not who I say? And does anyone have any proof that I've ever sinned? Anyone? Just give me one person. And guess what he got? Nothing. Zero. 
Because Jesus alone is sinless. There's no other world religion founder that has been able to make this claim. Not one. And Jesus stands alone because Jesus is God and God is sinless. And Jesus said he's the only way to heaven. Another staggering claim. I was sat with a realtor a few years ago discussing some different things and in this discussion, me being a Christian and just how the conversation evolved and I, I had brought up faith in the conversation and they were very uncomfortable and they made this statement. Yeah, but as long as you're a nice person and you don't hurt people, like everyone will go to heaven, right? Again, that's one of the greatest lies in history. You see, you can be the nicest person. You can be the friendliest person. You can be the most generous person with your money towards the church. You can be a person that treats your spouse with all the respect in the world. You can be the nicest of the nice that people publicly would only say good things about you. But at the end of the day, I want to tell you that without Jesus Christ in your life, you are lost to an eternity without Jesus and without God. Because Jesus is the only way to heaven. And until you bow your knee before Almighty God, and until you say, God, I'm no longer Lord of my life. I'm no longer making decisions out of my own motives. I'm no longer doing things for my purposes. I do it for the kingdom of God. And until the church of Jesus Christ gets back to that place, my friends, oh, I shiver on the inside when I think about what it'll look like on the day when Jesus returns for His church. I was preaching in Jamaica some years ago and a friend of mine, when he got up on the stage, he was, well, three of us were speaking at this conference and he said there will be three surprises when you get to heaven. The first surprise will be that you actually made it. The second surprise will be people that you thought would be there, weren't there. And the third surprise is people that you didn't think would be there, were there. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? When the day comes when you stand or fall on your face before the judgment throne of Jesus Christ, and in that moment and in that span of time, He's going to look at your life and he will tell you pretty soon, either yes, you can enter into the joy of the Lord, or no, I never knew you. And you may have attended church for 50 or 60 years. I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how much you've attended church. It doesn't matter how much you give or what you've done on this earth. It'll all be laid bare before the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you better get right before God. God will never be in your debt, ever, ever. So we owe everything to Jesus, everything. The Word of God tells me that He holds the very breath that you breathe. That is only because of His grace that you were able to get to this building this morning. You're here because He's allowed you to be here for such a time as this. He's allowed you here today because someone was going to come and preach the Word of God to you to awaken the seed of eternity that He's planted in your heart when you were knit together in your mother's womb. That's why you're here this day. You're not here by mistake. You're here because God needs you here. He wants you here. And He wants to save you and rescue you and set you free. That's the God that we serve and He's alive. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. You see, religion can't save you. Your money can't save you. 
Only a relationship with Jesus can save you. The truth of the Bible is simply this, that there is no rescue from our human condition. There is no grace from our past wrongdoings. There is no newness of life. There is no turnaround. There is no repentance. And there is no reconciliation with God until you have a relationship with the sinless Lamb of Jesus. And unless you accept Jesus into your life, you are lost in eternity. I know today people don't want to talk about heaven and hell. I'm going to tell you right now, my dear friends, heaven is a real place and people will go there. Hell is real. Souls will be lost to an eternity. For what? Because we're stubborn? Because we had a grudge? Because I stole, robbed? Because I said things I shouldn't say because I wanted to get my own way? The time will come, my dear friends, you need to hear what I'm telling you this day. The time will come when you will give an account. When God will ask you, and you can look to your right and to your left, and there will be no one at your defense. There will be no affinity group. There will be no one else around you. There will be nothing except you and God alone. And in that moment, he will call you to account for how you've lived your life. Or if you decided to just treat Christianity or religion as something trite, what will your decision be? What words will you say? See, Jesus is exclusive. He's in a category all of his own. But not only is Jesus exclusive, he is also inclusive. Because Jesus invites us all. Jesus invites us all. No matter what you've done, Jesus invites you. No matter what race you are, Jesus invites you. No matter how old you are or how young you are, Jesus invites you. No matter what religion you've practiced, no matter what satanic cult you've been involved in, Jesus invites you. It doesn't matter if you're gay, if you're straight, if you're atheist, or you're an agnostic, Jesus invites you. And the door is open to follow Jesus. We're celebrating Resurrection Sunday. Because Jesus is alive, and that's why he can invite you today. And you might think, well, I don't believe it. I'm going to tell you right now there's something in your heart of hearts that's already stirring in this room. I know there's something on the inside of you, and you're feeling it, and you're sensing it. I want you to know that is the power of the Spirit of Almighty God, and he's speaking to you. And Jesus says, come. You're welcome here. You see, but there's only one door. There's no end around. There's no back passage. There's nothing. There's one door, and that door is Jesus. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus. While Jesus is exclusive, he is inclusive, and you are welcome to come through the door of Jesus Christ. But there's no other way. There's no other system of ideas. There's no other gospel. There is only one way, and that way is Jesus. And Jesus made another claim, and he said, I will resurrect from the dead. <laughs> I mean, it sounds pretty outlandish, does it not? But Jesus said, I will resurrect from the dead. John 10, 33 to 34. He said, I will suffer. I will die. I will be denied, but three days later, I will rise again. And guess what? Jesus did 
just that. He was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you can go and you can visit the Garden of Gethsemane to this day. That's where he was arrested. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was falsely accused. He was flogged so that the flesh was torn from his body. They drove nails into his hands and into his feet. And they raised him into the air on a Roman cross, one of the worst torture devices ever created by human beings. And he was hung there naked to see for all the public to mock him and make fun of him. And then he died on the cross. They took a spear and they jabbed it into his side to make sure he was dead. But then before the Sabbath, a good man wanted to go and take his body down from the cross and they went and wrapped him in the linens and they placed him in a borrowed tomb because he was a young man. He didn't have a place already established and they placed him in the borrowed tomb. And now people started to grumble and complain. They're like, well, his disciples said he's going to raise from the dead. He made a claim he's going to come back to life. Make sure we put some guards in front of that tomb. Make sure we put a heavy stone in front of it and keep the guards there day and night so that no one can come in and roll that stone away. But guess Guess what happened? On the third day, there was breath from Almighty God in his body, and he started to breathe. And when he did, my friends, I'll tell you, he didn't need anyone else to come near, and the guards fell as dead. And Jesus emerged from the throne, from the, that tomb triumphant, and he's alive. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is alive to this day. The God that we serve is very much alive, and you need Jesus. Because he's the only one that can straighten out your marriage. He's the only one that can straighten out your life. He's the only one that can deliver you from the drugs. He's the only one that can deliver you from your addiction. He's the only way to heaven, and his name is Jesus. There was only one, and there is no other way ever. No matter what the world would tell you, that he is the only way, period, full stop. You see, Jesus' vindication was his resurrection. <laughs> he appeared to people over a period of 40 days, the Bible tells us, and they saw him. They saw the scars on his hands. They saw the wound on his side. They saw that he conquered death. The Bible says that he ate with people. They worshipped him. They met together. And history has never been the same since. And after that 40-day period was over, what did he do? Jesus ascended to heaven. And the Bible teaches us that he sits at the right hand of the Father and the day is coming. And my friends, I want to tell you, that day is closer than you might think. But Jesus is coming back for a church that's without spot and without wrinkle. And the day is close. But Jesus is coming back. What I love about the resurrection story is this. People like Peter and the other disciples. If you read in the book of Hebrews, it talks about the roll call of the faithful, the saints. And he says that they were wrapped in animal skins and fed the lions. They were used for sport. The emperor Nero would use them as human torches in his garden. People were persecuted, accused. But yet every single follower of Jesus, especially the early disciples, they never ever once wavered. They said, how can I deny what I've seen and heard? I have saw him heal the sick. I saw him deliver the demon possessed. I've seen him when he was raised upon that Roman cross. And I saw when his body came down. And I also experienced him when he rose from the dead three days later. I can't deny that there is no Jesus. I can only tell you that he is alive. They may not have understood the theology, but there was something in Scripture that is kind of like the young man who was healed from his blindness. And he said, I don't know what to tell you about this Jesus except I was blind and 
now I see. And that's what the disciples saw. They said, I don't understand it. I can't figure it out. I don't need to figure it out. All I know is Jesus is alive. And I will die for that. I will take that stand. And I don't care what you, you can throw me to the lions. You can burn me at the stake. You can crucify me upside down. You can fillet the skin off my body to try to get me to recant. But I tell you, I will not recant because I saw my Savior and my Jesus is alive. He's alive. If I get someone to come to the piano, I'm going to call. That's who Jesus is. He is the God-man. He is a humble servant. He is a good shepherd. He is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except by Him. While Jesus was on earth, He asked the question of one of His disciples named Peter. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. Jesus looks at Peter. Who do you say I am? Who do you say that I am, Peter? And you in this room tonight, today, who do you say Jesus is? That's the same question that's being asked of you today. Why is it being asked? Because you have a soul that's being weighed in the balance. You're in this room, again, not by accident, but because you have a living soul. And Jesus wants to rescue you. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to walk in the new life. Who do you say he is? People will end up in a hell for all eternity. Oh, there's pastors today who don't even believe in hell anymore, and I, I deal with that stuff. But I'm going to tell you it's a real place and people will go there. But heaven is also a real place and people will go there. And today you're at a crossroads. You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity. You see, history has been waiting for this sacred moment. And God knit you together in your mother's womb. He knew that there will be a day on March the 31st in 2024 when you will be sitting at Bethel Church in Barhead, Alberta because the Spirit of Almighty God has been at work in your life and you're not here by accident. You're here because He's called you to be here. And you've struggled. You've denied Jesus. You've decided not to go the way of the church. You've been hurt, maligned, abused but Jesus cares about you and he wants to make all things new for you so will you give your life to Jesus I mean, some of you right now you have a feeling in your heart some of you your palms are sweating your heart has been pounding out of your chest as I've been speaking that's the spirit of God and he's speaking to you you know there's something in your knower that's connected with your heart. And you know, you know it's you. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, you know. That's God. That's the Holy Spirit. He's working on you. He's compelling you. He's convicting you. Some of you feel a feeling of dread. That's, that's conviction. That's the convicting power of the Spirit of God. But not only is He convicting you, He is convincing you that Jesus is alive. That He is still on the throne. That He has a destiny for your life. That He has a plan for your life. That He cares about you. And that He died on the cross for you. And He rose again. And He's still alive. And He wants to work in your life in a miraculous way so He can get glory. So as Tanya plays, I'm going to ask every head in this room, if you would, no one moving around for a moment, every head bowed, every eye closed, just no moving around, no disturbing the person on your left or your right.
you're here this morning and you do not have a relationship with Jesus or maybe you used to have a relationship with Jesus but the Spirit of God has spoken to you today and perhaps you're watching online and the Spirit of God has spoken to you online today and you know you're not right with God you know you've been going in your own direction and God calls you to repent well that's a bit of a, a strange word we don't use that word in today's world but what repentance means is that you'll make a 180 and you stop walking in your direction and you turn and you walk in God's direction that's what repentance means it means a turning So with every head bowed, every eye closed in this room today and no one moving around, if you're in this house today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus or you know that your relationship is waned, would you be brave enough to raise your hand right where you are? I'm going to count to three and at the count of three, I just want to see those hands go up. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others in this place today? Don't be afraid. Hold them up there so I can see them. No one looking around, please. Thank you. I'm going to wait for another moment because I believe there's others in this room today and you need a relationship with Jesus. You know that you've been fighting. You've been wrestling. And God is calling you this day. Now, folks, I'm going to ask you to do something else and it's going to be very difficult. Those of you that have raised your hands in this place today, here's what I'm going to ask you to do next and it's important. You see, wherever there's an internal stirring, there has to be an external response. And as Tanya continues to play, I'm going to ask you right now just to slip out of your seat and walk down to the front. We have some prayer teams here, Pastor Boniface, Pastor Ben are here. They can pray over you, but I want you to come down here to the front and we're going to pray over you this morning. So prayer team, come on up. If that's you this morning, come up and take your places across the front. Quickly. Now, for those of you that have raised your hands, slip out of your seat this morning and come down to the front, and these people are going to lead you into a relationship with Jesus. There's not going to be anything that they can do, but they're just someone you can talk to. Now, I know this is tough. I know this is challenging, but I tell you, this will be life-altering for you. It will be life-altering for you to make that step. So just slip out of your seat and come down to the front. No one's going to hurt you. No one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to do anything to hurt you in any way, shape, or form. Just slip out of your seat right now as the music plays and come down to the front so we can pray over you this morning. God wants to set you on a new path. Go ahead. Slip out of your seat and come on down to the front. You know who you are. That's it. Keep coming. Keep coming. There are others in this place today. There are others in this place today. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Come on. No one's going to hurt you or embarrass you. You slip your hand up. The Holy Spirit has spoken to you. The Holy Spirit has stirred your heart in this place this morning. This is your moment. This is your moment. This is your moment. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are others here. There are others here this morning. There are others in this house this morning. No one's going to hurt you. Come on. Just be obedient that God is going to change your life in this place today. These people are going to help you. They're going to guide you. They'll get you some next steps. They'll connect you with your pastors. Thank you, Jesus. 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 I don't want to lose this sacred moment. I know some of you, you've got plans and you want to go and be with family, but I want to tell you this morning there are souls weighed in the balance in this house today. And I cannot let this go until you make that commitment to follow Jesus.
I'm going to ask one more time, just once more. I'm going to ask just once more. Will you be brave enough to slip out of your seat and come down and give your life to Jesus? Oh, my dear friends, don't say no. Do not say no. Do not say no. I plead with you this morning with all that's in me, do not say no. Do not say no. Oh, mighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus, there's nothing I can do, God. So, Father, I just thank you for those that have come forward this morning, and I pray now, God, that the light and light of Christ would just come to fruition in their lives like never before. Father, I thank you, O oh God, for their obedience. And Lord, I just pray that you would just bless them. Lord, that you would guide them and protect them. Father, for those, O oh God, that did not make that commitment today, Lord, they said, no, I'm not doing it. Father, I just pray you will grant them mercy. Oh God. Oh Father God. Oh mighty God. Father, I pray over this church. I pray over every congregant. I pray over every family represented in this place today. And I ask now, Almighty God, that you by your Spirit will do what needs to be done so you can get glory. Father, break every stronghold. Tear down every stronghold, every wall, everything that would set itself up against you in the mighty name of Jesus. So, Father, we just pray over this church, and we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do in Jesus' mighty name. This is a very special moment, and the prayer team is still going to be here for a little while. If you have any other thing you want God to touch you this afternoon. It's still your time. You're free to walk in there to one of these people here and then we'll pray for you. Let's just make this a house of prayer for a little while. Can you bow your heads? Be in that mood of prayer. Maybe you need something in your life, something in your family. And you're like, today, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I want it to be my day so that God is going to meet with my needs. Perhaps you're not feeling well in your health. He was bruised and he died so that you would be okay you will be healthy. So you are free to walk in here to one of these gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Let's just turn this to be now a house of prayer. Thank you, Ashes, for closing those doors. We don't need any distraction now. Let this be a house of prayer. Because God's presence is here this morning in, a, in such a powerful way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We give you glory and honor, Lord. You have anything you want God to touch? Just, just walk in. Take that step of faith. 
and lay everything under the feet of the cross. Thank you, yes, thank you. We don't want to rush into this moment. This is a, it's a very special moment. Encounter with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we praise you. Father, we give you glory and honor this morning. Thank you for who you are, Jesus. The Prince of Peace. The Lord of Lords. The King of Kings. Thank you. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The Savior. The Resurrected One. We thank you, Father. We give you glory and honor. In the wonderful name of Jesus, if you so believe with me, shout a big amen. Ah, uh, That's not enough. Shout a big amen. amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, this time, I would like to invest our senior pastor, our lead pastor, Pastor Ben, to come here and take over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Boniface. Thank you, Corey, uh, for sharing with us this morning so well. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and, and speaking to our hearts this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. God is so good. God is so good, and it is such a pleasure to be here uh, this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This day, Easter Sunday, the day the Lord has made, it's the day that we are reminded of the greatest demonstration of love ever. He is risen. Praise God. He is risen. Oh, a couple of you got it. He is risen. Friends, the manger, the cross, and the tomb are all empty. The one who vacated those three is the only one who is qualified and capable to fill our hearts and our lives. Hallelujah. And in so doing, transforms our lives and gives us a hope and a future. Praise God. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I'm going to tell you that Tanny and I and our family are rejoicing and very glad in this day. And even though we don't have a home just yet, <laughs> we are home. We are home. I'm happy. I'm happy to report that our home in Killam has sold. It's going to the lawyers on Tuesday without a realtor and without even advertising. We prayed God bring somebody to our house to buy our house, and he brought three, but only one could buy it. <laughs> Just prayed and asked, and he has provided that. Now we wait for him to open the door here. Now listen, friends. As we begin our ministry here, I want you to know that there are a few things that I'm fully committed to. Number one, I'm fully committed to seeking the Lord regularly for a strategy to reach the lost in this town and surrounding area. 
Secondly, I am committed to using whatever resource. Third, committed to walking alongside of you in good and bad and happy and sad and contented and mad because together we conquer, together we thrive because we're a family. Praise God. I just wanted to share some of these things in the half hour that I've been given. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm committing to equipping us and preparing us for the coming of the bridegroom. I'm committed to seeing each one of us, young and old, reach our full potential in the gifts and the ministries that God has called us to. And everyone has one. No one left behind. No one gets a free ride. Listen, friends, it's all for one and one for all. Listen, this town and county belongs to the Lord. Let's do our part to bring it back to Him. Amen? He gave His life. He paid the cost. Let's give her all to win the lost. I am committed to developing leaders who are sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice and to the Father's heart. I think I've said it here before. I don't want to just hear His voice. I mean, I can, you know, when I was at home on the farm, I could hear my dad's voice for a long ways away. I could be across the yard and hear my dad's voice. We can hear his voice. But you know what was even more special, friends? Was when I crawled up to in my daddy's arms and I heard his heart. I want to be so close, so intimate with my father that I can hear his heart beat. I want to hear his heart beat. I want to hear his heart beat. I don't think it's a secret, friends. I don't think it's a secret that the way things are looking around us, he's coming back very soon. And Corey's already alluded to that. And friends, it's all hands on deck if we are to complete the task that he has given us to do. Heaven. Heaven is counting on us. The cloud of witnesses are cheering us on. Let's give them even more to cheer about. Amen. So, Father, thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for this precious and wonderful Easter Sunday. And Father, we thank you for the opportunities that you bring our way. And God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would use each and every one of us in a very special way for your glory and for your honor. Would you use us, Lord? Would you use us to take your word to every person in this community? Jesus, you died for Barhead. You died for Barhead County. You died for the surrounding area. Lord, we want every one of them to know that fact. And we want everyone in this town, in this county, and surrounding area to embrace you and to fall deeply in love with you. So, Father, we give you praise this morning. We give you thanks. Lord, I pray for each one that's here. Lord, as we spend time with family today, God, would you bless our times together? Would you bless our families today, our family times today? Father, would you just minister to each one in a very special way? We pray in Jesus' name. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here to, uh, this morning. And uh, I look forward to, uh, well, I'm going to be here all week. 
and next week and the following week. You're stuck with me now. <laughs> God bless you. Have a great day. Amen.